Uh, my name is Marjorie Innocent, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here. Some of you I'm looking at, I'm like, yes, I've already welcomed you. So uh, good to see you again, and for everyone else, welcome to the 40th Annual Legislative Conference of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. We are very, very happy to have you all here today for this important and timely discussion. And we certainly hope that you will find the discussion with these most excellent panelists, very, very informative, very enlightening. I am the Senior Director of Research and Programs at the uh, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And as part of the work that we do at the foundation, we have a uh, Center for Policy Analysis and Research, or CPAR. And part of the work that we do at CPAR really involves identifying, uh, researching, analyzing, and also disseminating uh, critical information uh, research in, um, and policy information that will be very, very vital to African Americans. And so as a result, part of the work that we do is also highlight the work of some of our partners. And that is exactly what we are going to be doing here today. Earlier this year, the Annie Casey Foundation rele released one of its Kids Count reports, and it was a special report entitled Early Warning why reading by the end of third grade matters. And the report draws attention to the critical need for all children to achieve grade level reading proficiency by third grade, third grade. As you will very soon hear, the implications of this study are profound and are particularly relevant for African Americans and other people of color, as well as for current efforts to reform public education. We are very, very honored to have partnered with the Annie Casey Foundation to bring you this session today. On behalf of the foundation, I would like to welcome Sandra Avila to bring you some greetings and remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? My name is Sandra Avila, as Marjorie mentioned, and I'm with the Annie E. Casey Foundation. On behalf of the foundation, I really want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for letting us be here with you today uh, and for partnering with us on this very important issue. I believe we've been in partnership now with the foundation for about three years, um, and I can say that uh, it has been a very worthwhile partnership, and I think ha uh, we've learned a lot from each other. I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Scott and our program officer, Marjorie Innocent, for all their help and hard work in making today happen. Um, how many of you have heard of the Annie Casey Foundation? Okay, so a lot of you. So you know what we're dedicated to, improving the outcomes of children uh, in this country, particularly in communities of color. We think that uh, what you'll hear about today is very important. We know that the research shows that the ability to read by the end of third grade is really key to a child's success in school and really throughout his or her life. Um, and from birth until the end of third grade, we know that most kids are learning to read. And then after the third grade, they're really reading to learn. And so for us, this goes very much hand in hand with our belief that kids do well uh, when their families do well. And families do better when they live in supportive communities. And so I hope that what you all are able to um, Get, a, get from this conversation is really to learn a little bit more uh, about the importance of proficient <clears throat> reading by third grade, uh, identify some key issues uh, that contribute to some students falling behind, which we know happens all across the country. And I think that you'll also learn a little bit about what each of you can do in your own community um, to help with this issue. So I want to thank, again, on behalf of the foundation, all of the panelists here today, all of you for coming to attend the session. And again, a thank you to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for letting us be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, before we begin, I just want to make sure that everyone has, number one, received a uh, survey. Is the survey for this room yellow? Yes, it is. Uh, if you have not, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get one. It is really, really, uh, Marissa, when you get a chance, a couple of people behind. It is really, really important to us that you share your feedback with us. We really do uh, pay attention to it. The other thing is that there are copies of the Kids Count report as well as their uh, data count that are also here. If you have not received a copy of those, uh, let us know. Please raise your hand and we'll, we'll walk around the room and make sure that you receive that as well. 
Um, at this point, I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you our uh, most esteemed moderator for this session, uh, Ms. Stephanie Jones, who is the founder of Stephanie Jones Strategies and the former executive director of the National Urban League's Policy Institute. Please welcome Stephanie Jones. Good afternoon. Um, I am very pleased to have the honor of moderating this panel today, Lasting Advantage, wh why, reading matter why Reading by the Third Grade Matters. And I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for, uh, for hosting this, um, and as well as the NEA Casey Foundation. Um, we know how important the sponsors are, and we, ap we appreciate your support. And, um, and certainly, as Marjorie is um, going to do some other work, of course, um, I really want to thank her for all of her hard work and, um, and tremendous insight into this issue. Um, this, this topic is very important. Um, it's timely and compelling. Um, but, and that's one of the reasons that, that I'm so glad to be here. But another reason I'm really glad to be here is that it's a real honor and a privilege to be here with these esteemed experts on this topic. Uh, they're very committed educators, policy makers, and thought leaders, and they're truly making a difference in the educational lives of African American children. And I think we'll, we'll get a lot out of what they have to say. Um, I just want to preface, um, uh, preface this by kind of framing the, framing the issue for us today. Um, at w at when I was at the National Urban League Policy Institute, I was also the editor of the State of Black America. And, w and as you know, as you probably know, the State of Black America documents the equality gaps. Uh, that w across a, a number of different um, areas, and we certainly saw a lot of um, serious problems in terms of um, of reading proficiency and educational attainment, um, it, particularly with African American children. And even though, um, as is noted in the um, in the report that you have today, the um, we have seen some some improvements, and we see incremental improvement across all socioeconomic and, and racial spheres. Um, we also continue to see these equality gaps with particularly African American children um, having trouble um, really catching up. They're keeping up but not catching up. Um, I think we can liken it to the caboose on a train. And the train speeds up, the train slows down, sometimes the train stops, but um, the caboose always stays in the same, same, you know, same position relative to the, to the train. Um, it never quite catches up. And that's something that we see with our children, and it's something that we've really got to, we, we have got to make a concerted effort and really ramp up our efforts um, to try to close these gaps so that our children are no longer the caboose trailing the train. So today we're gonna take a hard look at one, at the, the aspect of this, of this overall educational problem of reading proficiency. Uh, third, uh, uh, you know, why aren't our children uh, re reading as well by third grade, and what do we have to do to get them there? And our experts will explain the importance of proficient reading by third grade. They'll identify the issues that contribute to students falling behind, uh, behind the reading curve, and then they'll offer specific recommendations to reverse this trend. This is going to be an exciting and informative discussion, but it's only a first step. And so it's our hope that our conversation today will give you the very specific and concrete tools that you can use to help reverse this trend and tools that we hope will empower you to make a, a real difference in the educational prospects of our children. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. And after a, a brief introduction, I will ask each of the panelists a question. And they'll each speak for about, about six to eight minutes. And then we will open it up to a broader discussion. And then we'll have Q&A from, um, from the audience, because we certainly want to hear um, hear your questions and your comments. And then we're going to conclude the session with each panelist offering one very specific, very concrete thing that you can do to help close the reading proficiency gap in your own communities. So um, as I said, it's a delight to, to be here with these wonderful um, experts on this topic. And I think you're going to get a lot out of hearing from them. So I will um, introduce them from um, in the order in which they're sitting, but not, not necessarily in the order in which they're speaking. Um, um, our first um, speaker is Dr. Janice Cooper, who directs the National Center for Children in Poverty, a leading research and policy center dedicated to promoting the economic security, health, and well-being of the nation's low-income families and children. Her current research portfolio includes studies on mental health services for young children in the child welfare system and funding mental health services for children and adolescents. 
Dr. Cooper received her PhD in health policy from Harvard University, her master's degree from Columbia and Harvard, master's degrees, excuse me, from Columbia and Harvard, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Essex in Colchester, England. Uh, then we have Dr. Carol Brunson Day, who is president and CEO of the National Black Child Development Institute, whose mission is to improve and advance the quality of life for black children and families through advocacy and education. From 1985 until 2004, she served as the president and CEO of the Council for Professional Recognition, a Washington, D.C.-based association that serves as the home of the Child Development Associate, Associate National Credentialing Program and the National Head Start Fellowship Program. Dr. Day received her BA in psychology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, an MED in early childhood education from the Erickson Institute in Chicago, and a PhD in education from Claremont University in Claremont, California. This is a serious panel, isn't it? <laughs> uh, next we have Brigadier General Velma Vaughn Richardson, uh, a retired the U.S. Army. Uh, she is a business development principal at Lockheed Martin Information Systems and Global Services and serves on the Executive, Executive Advisory Council of Mission Readiness Military Leaders for Kids, a nonprofit bipartisan organization committed to ensuring continued American security and prosperity in the 21st century that, by calling for smart investments in the up upcoming generation of American children. She received a direct commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve and she retired from active duty in October 2003. She's one of only seven African-American women to have earned the rank of Brigadier General in the active army. Um, General Richardson received a BS in mathematics from Livingston Co Livingstone College and an MA from Pepperdine University. Our next speaker is Dr. Lillian Lowry who was appointed Secretary of Education for the State of Delaware in 2009 after serving as Superintendent of the Christina School District in Newcastle County, Delaware. Prior to her tenure in Delaware, Dr. Lowry was the Assistant Superintendent of Cluster 7 for Fairfax County Public Schools in Fairfax County, Virginia, and was a high school principal and assistant principal, a minority student achievement monitor, and a secondary English teacher. She holds a Doctor of Education in Education in Education and Policy Studies from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, a Master of Education in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and a Bachelor of Arts in English Education from North Carolina Central University. Our next speaker is Sean Dove, um, who joined the Open Society Institute U.S. Program Staff in, 2000, in May 2008 to launch and lead the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a national philanthropic initiative that builds on OSI's existing grant-making strategies to improve the life outcomes of black men and boys in the areas of education and family. He holds an undergraduate degree in English from Wesleyan University and is a graduate of Columbia University Business School's Institute for Nonprofit Management. And last but not least, um, we have David Johns, who many of you may know. Uh, he currently serves as Senior Education Policy to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, the Health Committee. Uh, David is the lead aide responsible for policy and programs invol involving early childhood education, women and children, and workforce development. Prior to working for the Senate Health Committee, David served as a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow in the Office of, Congressional Char uh, Office of Congressman Charles Rangel. And he's also founder of DJJ Consulting, a boutique con consulting firm committed to increasing underserved students' access to quality educational opportunities and experiences. So let's just give a round of applause to our speakers. And so we're really looking forward to a, to a wonderful discussion, and we're going we're gonna to launch right into it. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Janice Cooper. And who is going? And, and let me just explain. For the most part, we're going to speak um, at the at the table because we think that will just help things flow um, uh, flow into a, a discussion a little more easily. But um, Dr. Cooper has a, a PowerPoint presentation, so she is going to come up and, and do her presentation, just so you don't get confused about the movements. But um, I will lead off with a question um, for you that could, will take you into your discussion. Uh, now, as the director of the National Center for Children in Poverty, you're on the you're on the cutting edge of researching and promoting social, um, socio-emotional well-being of African-American children. 
And you're not only you're not only familiar with the raw data relating to our children's education, but you have an in-depth understanding of the impact that education has on our children and our communities. And so, would you give us an overview of how Black children fare academically um, overall, with a look at the factors that impact impact Black student achievement, and also the implications of this situation for not only the children but for their families and the and our communities? Absolutely. Coming. Okay. Did I do something? To no, you? no, you didn't. Oh, okay. It just went to sleep. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my only challenge is to give you the information I need to give you in the time I have. So um, I'm from New York, I live in New York, and so I'm going to be speeding down the road uh, giving you this information. And hopefully, um, this is really a picture of some of the data that's in the book that you uh, have, uh, that's just been shared with you. A uh, couple of things, I hope what I'm doing is setting the context for a larger discussion, and I, I will address the questions that uh, Stephanie raised, but uh, uh, within setting the context. I think the most important thing for me to say uh, right off the bat is that um, why reading by third grade matters is that um, not just African American communities in this country, but the entire country is dependent for its productivity on the success of African American children. If they do not succeed, more and more jobs are going to go out of this country, just as one barometer as we think about the economy. So. The National Center, uh, Stephanie explains, so I won't take a lot of time other than to say that what we're focused on is improving outcomes for the next generation of children and their families. And um, at the very outset, we find that there are disparities uh, that impact achievement, and they begin very early. So when you think about a baby and infant at nine months, we already begin to see lower scores on cognitive tests. We begin to see uh, uh, increased likelihood of poor outcomes uh, for black children, and uh, we also begin to see uh, less likelihood of secure attachments, which are critical for uh, uh, children developing. And at 24 months, we see uh, similar kinds of uh, scores. In fact, uh, they, they only seem to get worse, and so outcomes for uh, black toddlers at 24 months uh, are worse in terms of health outcomes, and you see uh, uh, less secure uh, attachments or for black uh, toddlers. And then uh, Marjorie shared with you the data from uh, Annie Casey, and that really comes from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And you can see there, by fourth grade, you've got differences in race, ethnicity. And I just want to uh, point out to you, just look at the, the chart that says below basic. And what are, we t what are we talking about? We're talking about African American children uh, at a, uh, fourth grade, at least 50% of them reading below the basic level. And I always, I always like to do a talk that talks not just about how we're struggling, but also talk about those children that are making progress. And some African American children are making progress. Uh, and we have a number of states in which uh, uh, African American children are making progress in terms of proficiency. But let me draw attention, your attention to the states where 10% or less of African American children are proficient at grade level. And so you, you see uh, the red states, which uh, encompass Louisiana, Mississippi, Michigan, and Wisconsin, uh, to name a few. So what are some of the factors uh, that Stephanie asked? What are the factors that impact achievement for black children? Well, we know that income matters. We know that strong attachments matter. Positive nurturing relationships with families matter, and those interactions uh, impact children's language acquisition and the, the development of their uh, linguistic development, which helps them with reading. We know that social emotional competence matters. We know that high quality early care settings matter, and that stability in child care matters. And what do I mean by that? A child that, and I'll show you some data quickly about that, but a child that moves more between uh, kindergarten and third grade is more likely to be retained at grade level, and that child is less likely to do well and achieve at grade level. We have uh, huge uh, concerns about chronic absenteeism, believe it or not, even at K. 
And then we know that strong and robust instructors that have competencies in communities and in the culture and in family engagement also matter. So we talked about income mattering. And so that th these are the figures for 2008. And in a couple of, uh, in fact, next week, we expect the figures for 2009 in terms of low income and poverty in the United States. And you can see the percentage of children under six in low income and poor families by race. And so low income means 200% of poverty, twice the federal poverty level. And we, I told you already that stability matters. And the research suggests that um, 30, across the United States, 36% of young children, K23, move at least once. However, for African Americans, that's 40%. And for Latinos, that's 37%. We know that social emotional development matters and that uh, that impacts children's learning, functioning, and their ability to achieve. There are certain uh, family risk factors, including poverty, that increase the odds of behavioral problems. And there's some wonderful studies that show that families, that you, if you give families enough of an income, they have the ability to stay and work with their children and supervise their children, and the behavioral problems are reduced. And we know that parenting matters, and there's some research that shows that if you really target parenting strategies for families, and there are others on the panel that can speak more eloquently than that, that really impacts uh, children's success. And I talked to you earlier about chronic absenteeism, that uh, the more children miss of school, it's intuitive, the more likely that they're, they're going to have trouble succeeding. And uh, chronic absenteeism among uh, African American and Latino kids are a problem, especially in the first grade. We also know that geography matters. And what do I mean by that? We can look at all the wonderful uh, statistics about uh, school achievement, but it really depends on which state you live in, whether all of our kids are counted in the test scores or not. And we know that for many states, uh, children with some kind of, uh, with any kind of disability or English language uh, deficiency may be excluded from assessment. So we may not even be getting the true picture and the true extent to which uh, African American children are falling behind. What can we do to, to address, uh, redress the trend? Uh, one thing is obviously to make, uh, make uh, work pay to ensure that families can make a decent living, that families are engaged at all levels and we are engaging in families, that we apply what we know works and lots of people here can talk about the different strategies that work. But more important that we go, we go beyond talking about the numbers and holding people accountable for the numbers. Um, and in Washington, D.C., you just had an election, and my understanding is that at least part of it was around education and educational outcomes and, uh, and accountability. Uh, so we certainly know that public accountability uh, needs to happen. And we need to ensure that the interventions that we bring for children are culturally relevant, because we, we can spend a lot of money spinning our wheels, and if those interventions don't work for families, uh, then we're just spinning our wheels. And then finally, we need to bring strategies up to scale. And there's been a lot of discussion about some successful academic achievement strategies in the United States, Promise Academy being one of them. The problem is that those are just small, what we call pods of excellence within a sea of need. And so we really need to bring some of these strategies that we know work to scale. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Not only did you talk, is this on? Can you hear me? I think he speaks. Okay. Yeah, that, that was very, very helpful. Thank you. you. Not only do you talk fast, but you have a lot to say, and you, <laughs> and you said it beautifully. Um, and that, that gives us a great segue to our next, um, our next panelist, um, General Richardson, um, because you talked about, um, especially as you talked about how to reverse the trend and what we need to do next, and of course we know that's going to take resources. And a lot of that is going to involve generating public support and changing the conversation. And General Richardson, you're, you've been a strong and stalwart voice in calling for investment in education. But you've been doing it from a, way that we, from a perspective that we don't often hear, um, from a national security perspective. Um, and because, and that's, I think it's very important because often in, con in public conversations about education uh, and, and at education and national security, they're sort of pitted against each other as if they're mutually exclusive and that when, they're, when we're dealing with the allocation of scarce resources, then education tends to be backburnered with a focus on national security. You have a very different perspective on this and um, can help us um, better understand how education is a national security priority 
Um, and you can also help us change that, that public conversation to get more people to better understand that. Can you help us, can you help us do that today? Well, uh, thank you, Stephanie. I'll do my best. Uh, uh, it's certainly uh, a wonderful opportunity to, to be able to have my say uh, today uh, with, the, with this, uh, this group on, uh, on why reading by the third grade really matters. Um, and I got involved in this with, uh, with mission readiness, of which I'll mention uh, here in just a few minutes a little bit more about it, uh, and the Annie E. Ca uh, Casey Foundation. So that certainly brought a lot of, uh, of insight uh, for me. Uh, but I want to start by telling you that today's U.S. Armed Forces uh, is certainly still the very best in the world. Um, the men and women who uh, who have elected to serve in the armed forces uh, to preserve our national security, to uh, preserve our longstanding liberties and human rights um, are absolutely exceptional in every way that I can think of. Uh, and that their choice uh, to join the military certainly puts them in a group that, uh, that's about one to two percent of our American citizens. Uh, and they come from every possible walk of life. Um, but to maintain uh, the U.S.'s position in the world and to maintain and preserve uh, those liberties that I just mentioned requires a bench. You all are certainly uh, familiar with the sports analogy of having to have a bench of players just in case. Well, we need a bench of young people who can serve uh, in the military. And so we need folks who are ready, willing, and able. But unfortunately, uh, as you've just heard, there's some challenges to that because we have a lot of young people who are ready and willing but are unable because of a lack of reading and math skills, so education. Uh, they also have some challenges with regard to health issues, primarily obesity, and you might guess they also have some challenges in regard uh, to crime. Um, but I believe that the core um, to increasing uh, the, uh, our young people, our elementary school kids' ability to read at grade level at, by the third grade or above that level is to focus on education uh, and, and reading. Uh, and as you also just heard, uh, it is in the fourth grade where our students must be able to read to learn so that they can now grasp uh, more complex and diverse uh, concepts, theories, ideas, and, and, and develop their critical thinking as they matriculate through middle school, high school, and on into the university uh, system. Um, research has certainly shown that uh, a child that is lagging behind is much more likely to drop out of high school. And guess what? The Army, the military, requires a high school education. Um, and we certainly don't need any more proof of it. You just heard uh, some of the statistics here. Uh, regarding what that dropout rate looks like. So that bench that I just talked about uh, is critical to having a population of young folks age 17 to 24 thereabouts who are ready, willing, and able uh, to serve. And, uh, and so, of course, we have a lot of them, uh, about 75% of them, that today are ineligible for one of those three reasons that I just talked about. And so that's really why I decided to join Mission Readiness when I was uh, approached. Uh, it's a, a group of about 150 plus general and flag officers, and we are um, focused on education front and center for our, for our young folks. Um, and not just for the military, because it has other implications, as you might guess. Uh, and so we've been calling on Congress to support uh, high quality early education programs, and we believe that pre-kindergarten programs, high quality pre-kindergarten programs, is certainly the way to 
improve academic achievement, to increase graduation rates, and of course, to expand the population of young folks who, um, uh, who might be willing to join, uh, join the military service. Um, one of my colleagues, Seth uh, Kahn, is in the audience there. He just raised his hand. Um, and I would also tell you that, so while I'm representing mission readiness and, and talking about getting people, uh, young folks ready for military service or being able to be ready for military service, this is also good for business. Mm -hmm. It's good for industry. It's good for academia. It's good for our government. It's good for our economy. Um, we absolutely uh, need to do that. All of the organizations that I personally belong to have some sort of an education thrust. And, uh, and as I look back on it, I suppose that means that maybe I have some sort of a passion uh, in this area. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's just, that's just one of the things that I, I try to link everything that I do, all that, uh, that I belong to, to education. And certainly from my workplace, uh, Stephanie said that I work at Lockheed Martin. Uh, the same is true, and so I'm going to take it a little bit further and take a look at, so if you're not capable of reading by the end of the third grade, how do we get, because Lockheed Martin is in the science, technology, engineering, math areas. That, those are the kinds of people that we hire. How in the world do you get people who can, at some point, be able to come to a Lockheed Martin and be successful researchers, engineers, uh, or professors uh, out, uh, out in the world, um, and, uh, and, and our inventors of the future. How do we do that if we don't get them properly educated, able to read by the end of the third grade? I believe that um, this is a challenge for not just our children, but certainly for our nation, and I consider it a national security crisis today. Thank you, thank you. That, I think that gives us a really interesting perspective and it gives us a little bit of, um, uh, th that's a really important tool we can take in terms of our, even our conversations um, on this issue as we're, as we're pushing for, um, uh, for increased support for, for education programs. So thank you very much. Um, then that, that then though raises another question because as we're talking about these priorities that you all have raised, um, Again, we cannot look at this in isolation. We have, um, there also have to be some tools and some, some resources brought to bear. An important aspect of this, um, of, of this are the teachers and the educators who, are, who we're, we're counting on to educate our children. And so, um, uh, Dr. Day, you, are, um, you have done tremendous work in this area of um, teacher preparedness um, and readiness. And, but we often, again, when we, when we talk about that, we, we, we talk about teacher preparedness, often it's done almost as a, in a contentious way of, um, uh, of, again, sort of pitting the teachers or the educators against, um, against educators and against those who are trying to bring about reforms. First of all, why, you can just lay the groundwork, why um, is teacher readiness, teacher preparedness important, um, an important factor in um, educating our uh, educating African American children, um, particularly in the area of reading proficiency, and then what do how can we um, better ensure uh, that teachers are prepared to teach our children? All right. Well, we um, National Black Child Development Institute has been involved with in the lives uh, of young children and families for 40 years. Our mission is to improve the uh, health and well-being, the general welfare of those families through advocacy and education, as you mentioned. And my own background has been in early childhood education and in teacher preparation. Um, and one of the things we know from studies, we, we've known it really from common sense, but we also know from studies that the quality of the teacher is a major factor in whether children are successful in school, all through school. The quality of the teacher, the Issues that surround quality vary. So for some, it, with some studies, they look at the type of teacher preparation that a person has or the level of teacher preparation. Teachers with BA degrees, for example, 
are shown in, in some studies to be more successful with children than teachers with associate degrees, associate level degrees, and so forth. Um, but there's also other factors that affect teacher quality, and one of them, which um, I care a lot about, we at the Institute care a lot about, has to do with cultural competence. And by that we mean um, teachers who understand the values and behaviors uh, that children have been socialized with as they are raised at home. This is particularly important as young children are coming into school at younger and younger ages. If you think about um, our communities, babies are generally taken care of by families or family members, and then as they get older, they get out into the community and they may go to daycare s settings, but those settings are very often staffed by people from the community. And then eventually they will go into school settings, which may be in their community, but they're not necessarily as close to the community as maybe child care, ch the child care system. And so when you look at the, the teaching workforce or the adults who are working with young children, there's often a shift in terms of the cultural backgrounds of teachers from the time children are at home at, uh, through the time they get into the early years of school, kindergarten through third grade. Now we think that it is important that children aren't faced with conflict around cultural values when they enter school. Because if they do, then children get confused. Um, again, it's common sense, if you will. Uh, I grew up in a black neighborhood and all of the teachers at my elementary school, I grew up in the day days of segregation as I sometimes say, the good old days of segregation. And that doesn't mean that I don't think that integration was a plus and was needed. But I grew up with teachers who understood from whence I came and what kind of skills I needed to get to where our community wanted us to go. And they were, in essence, bicultural. And I, I don't know whether that terminology was used back then but that's exactly what they were. They knew how to tell us, this is not the way you talk at school. This is the way, but this is the way we talk at home and in our communities. And they were able to socialize us and in, a, in a very accepting way of the ways in which we operated at home and in the community and help us learn the ways that we would need to operate to move and be successful in a wider world. That's what if our, our teachers are culturally competent, they can do that with kids. When they're not, they interfere with their development. There are, and that's common sense if you have had an experience like I have had it in my community. But there are studies now that demonstrate that and they point it out. And I want to share one with you, one of my favorite ones, which was done with African American first grade kids in Oakland, California. And the study was designed to examine the controversial speech patterns in the black community, which I will just call Ebonics, um, and their relationship to reading success. Kids who speak in the language of the black community, what's the relationship between that and their ability to succeed in reading? And this particular researcher found six different teaching styles, um, six different ways in which teachers responded to um, the language of their kids. But the two styles that were correlated with the highest achieving kids and the lowest achieving kids are very significant. The least successful teachers, she, she labeled the interrupting group. And those were teachers who constantly asked children to repeat words pronounced in dialect, in Ebonics, asked them to repeat them many times and interrupted the pronunciations, interpreted, excuse me, interpreted the, the dialect pronunciations as reading errors, okay? So if kids were, um, well, I, I'm not going to go into the characteristics, but in any case, this interruption, this, this style of teaching, these practices, had a stultifying effect on their teacher, on their children's, on the students' reading development, reflected not only in lower reading scores, but also in the fact that some children withdrew from participating in reading. 
speaking softly and as seldom as possible, okay? And it's just a, it's a characteristic that teachers have when they don't understand the language patterns of the kids and not just understand, but don't understand, nor respect them, nor understand how to use them to help children learn and be accepted in the classroom. By contrast, the, the other group, the teachers with kids who had the highest reading uh, scores, were what she called black artful teachers. They used the rhythmic play and instruction and encouraged children to participate by listening to their responses. They attended to vocabulary differences in black children and seemed to prevent structural conflict by teaching children to listen for standard English sound distinctions. There are some sounds that Ebonic speakers use that aren't present in, um, uh, in the same way in in as in standard English dialect. Okay, not only did children taught by this approach participate enthusiastically in reading, they showed the highest reading scores. So when you have a teacher who is culturally competent, kids achieve. They achieve reading, they have stronger self-concepts, there are a number of researchers who are working uh, to produce other studies and other areas that are looking at social emotional development, the kind of things that Janice pointed out. Uh, it isn't just one set of skills, nor is it, does it work in one domain of growth and development or school achievement. Cultural competence is very critical for us uh, and for our children's success in school. Um, and I have some recommendations about how we can ensure that in our communities. I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, that, again, that is, I think that is an area that um, we just don't hear very much about. And that's it's something that um, I think and that also goes to the, the issue of the complexity of what we're dealing with because there's so many different pieces that we have to try to fit in together, which, which actually leads into um, Dr. Lowry's um, presentation because um, uh, these issues can't be addressed, cannot be addressed in a vacuum. There are so many different um, players and, and pieces that have to be tied in together, but it's almost like trying to, uh, to use a cliche to build an airplane while flying it. Mm -hmm. um, and these different dynamics have to be meshed together. Um, you and in Delaware, and speaking of elections, I mm -hmm. guess there, you had an interesting <laughs> one, an interesting one yesterday. Um, but in, in Delaware, you've launched a multi-agency initiative um, called Early Success, and it's aimed at doing that. And, and by all accounts, it seems to be working, and, and working very well. Could you tell us what um, Early Success is all about and why it's important to develop this type of co cooperative model um, for addressing uh, our children's needs in this area. Thank you, and um, this portion of the um, beginning does tie nicely with the previous speakers, because as um, a Secretary of Education that deals with districts and charter schools, the question that society asks, especially around our children of poverty and color, are what are those schools doing to our children? And so first we're gonna own that we have to do better. We have to be culturally competent. Um, we have to make sure that what we're doing is age and grade level appropriate with our students. But I also want you to listen and, and really take away from this what the speakers before me have said, especially the beginning data. As early as nine months, we start seeing developmental um, delays in our children. When we have children of poverty, what, ends to, what usually ends up happening is grandma loves them. If they stay at home zero to five or auntie, mm -hmm. they love them to death and they are feeling really good about themselves. But there are the other interventions that need to happen that are not happening with those students. Do um, they just do simple things like learn their colors, um, be able to kind of recognize their name when they see it written down, know their alphabet. So when we talk about what's happening in schools, we cannot talk about K through 12 or K through 16 unless we talk about birth through age five. Because I will uh, submit to you that the achievement gap walks into the kindergarten classroom and then it persists if we don't train our teachers appropriately to deal with children where they are. So what the Delaware Success Plan, and I, I've given copies of this for you to take away with you, 
the Delaware Success Plan is a plan that was created through policy. Our state is so severely, and I love that we are collaboratively focused on zero to five. We understand, just as um, the Obama administration has stated in its policy, that the age zero to five is a key and critical link to what happens when students enter kindergarten. The early success plan in Delaware is our way of determining how we're going to make that link work. And it looks at five areas, with the end game being ready children. And so in order for us to have ready children, those children who walk into our schools healthy, physically, emotionally, socially, and ready to learn, there are other people have to, who have to be ready before they walk in. So we have to have ready families. That means we have to work with all these agencies that you're going to hear about today, um, private and public, to make sure that parents know and understand where the resources are to get the support for their children and their families zero to five. What's in the community, what services are there, and how can we intervene and support our families? So when we have ready families, we also have to have ready care and programs for our early years, that we have to have them. And you've heard already, the quality of the people standing there is important. Um, a lot of the states are going um, to licensing early care providers by looking at the amount of education that they have. Well, there are going to be some family centers where we're not going to have that level of education at, on every level. So what, how can schools and state agencies partner with those early care providers to pull them into training that is available just to give them some rudimentary mm -hmm. skills to work with these kids? Let's be real. Everybody's not going, who's working and touching these children zero to five are not going to have BA degrees. They're just not. So it's incumbent upon us as a nation and as a community to get resources, private and public, to help them build their skills so they can help the children. We have to have ready early care and education programs if these students are going to be ready to learn. We have to have ready communities. We can't stand around and point fingers. What are the schools doing? Well, what are the early care providers doing? Well, well what is um, the state government doing? What's the federal government doing? The community owns these children. They are our future. And we have to all come together and do whatever. The medical community has to volunteer hours if they need to, to screen their vision, to screen um, their dental hygiene, to give those hours to these students. So they're, if they're not healthy and well, they're certainly not going to learn. And then we have to have ready schools. Our schools can no longer work in isolation. They have to understand where these children have been and partner with these early care providers and, and programs to make sure that they understand the children who are walking in the door where their deficiencies may be. And so in order to do that in Delaware, we're looking at kindergarten preparedness. We have something called a STARS program. It is a five-tier program. Many of your states probably have it. And what we're doing is we're rating our um, early care providers. And what we're doing with those ratings is making sure that we publicly recognize those who are doing well. And we're going to strengthen that by when our students get into the kindergarten, giving them a preparedness test. And that's not saying that we're not going to be pointing out who's not doing a great job. We're going to be pointing out who's doing a good job. Where, from where are the children coming who are coming ready to learn? And what we've had to do to make sure that all of these things integrate well is start something called an interagency resource management council. Because when people talk about children not coming to school ready to learn and when we talk about early care and learning programs, people tend to think of the state's Department of Education. We have the smallest amount of early care and programs <clears throat> at the Department of Education. The most of that resides in we call it Department of Health and Social Services, but Department of Health and Human Services, because that's where Medicaid is with purchase of care, especially for our children of poverty, and our children's department. So what the state did was, in policy and code, coalesced a, co a committee, the Interagency uh, Resource Committee, where co-chaired by the Secretaries of Education, Health and Human Services, and the Children's Department, and also including the Director of Office Management and Budget and the Controller General so that we can make sure that we're putting funds available. And that way we have mental health, we have um, children's services, and we have education at the table, planning that zero to five, looking at licensure of our care programs, and making sure that our STARS program um, go into those programs and 
make the link very noticeable between zero to five and um, early literacy. I would love to talk more about it because we're really excited. I just want to give you one example of where we um, have to make sure that quality is in front of our children. And that is what Secretary Duncan talks about all the time, is the quality of the teachers and the leaders. Our state is investing a lot of money in full day kindergarten. And what I want you to walk away with um, as a community is just because they're there doesn't mean it works well for our children. We did a study, the University of Delaware did a study, and they did a comparison of students who are in half day kindergarten and full day kindergarten. Not only were some of our students in half day kindergarten doing better than the children in full day kindergarten, but some of our children in full day kindergarten were regressing. And except for the chronological growth they were having, they were having no growth. And I will tell you why. What we looked at when we got down to the indicator of that was those folks who are trained to work in early care, early literacy, when their training is around zero to third grade, they have completely different, completely different ways of engaging kids on age appropriate levels than those who are trained in early childhood, which would be kindergarten through sixth or seventh grade. So can you imagine a little kid coming to kindergarten, sitting in a straight row and having someone lecture to them and treat them like they may be in fifth or sixth grade? That's happening in some of our full day kindergarten programs. We have to look at the social, the emotional, at the physical well-being of these children and make sure that we touch, we touch all those age-appropriate kinds of teaching methodologies if our children are going to be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all of the things that, that you all are talking about are, you know, are issues related to education and, and African-American children that we're very familiar with and we know that, um, we, we know that there are some serious challenges. However, when it, all of these challenges are certainly increased when it comes to our African-American boys. Um, this, for everything that we're talking about, it seems to be heightened um, when it comes to our children. Um, Sean, you are, a, a, you are very committed and you're very active in uh, working to improve the lives of African-American boys, especially in the area of education. How do, can you talk to us about and give us your insights on how the, the social, social and economic realities um, in this society are impacting um, the, the educational um, attainment, the educational prospects of, of African American boys um, in this country, and, and also how do we, how do we address this, uh, this issue in a way that really has, we keep talking about it, but mm -hmm. how, do, how can we address it in ways that have a real impact? Great, happy to be here, and I'll refrain from using the metaphor that they saved the brothers for last on the uh, <laughs> panel and uh, that uh, will uh, indicate. Um, we've all heard uh, in, in recent weeks uh, the Schott Foundation um, for Public Education report that uh, revealed that nationwide, uh, except for a few states, that black boys' graduation rate is at 50% or lower. Cities uh, where I live and work, uh, New York, uh, is at 32%. And uh, the question begs, how did they get there? And two years ago, uh, the Open Society Institute launched a campaign for black male achievement. And when we decided where we needed to focus, we f focused on three core investment areas that we knew uh, through research, strategic planning, talking to experts in the field that we could not address uh, or, or be catalytic around improving the life outcomes of black men and boys without addressing education, without addressing work and employment, and without addressing family structures and support. And there are a whole lot of other issues, and it was really uh, refreshing to hear about the holistic interconnectedness uh, uh, about this. Because you said earlier, uh, if we don't catch up by the ninth, by, by catch up, if we don't catch up, we never will. And a couple of things, uh, another research uh, report that the Schott Foundation did, uh, they show that at ninth grade, if our boys are not at grade level, particularly in reading and math, that just increased their chances of dropping out. So um, 
what happens before ninth grade. And this is why this uh, issue is really uh, important uh, to the campaign for uh, black, male, black male achievement. Although our investments are at the middle school and the high school level, I think it's really important that funders kind of collaborate. And I had this conversation with Annie Casey and Ralph Smith and they said, well, we're focusing on this area. So how do you, because there's a continuum that's, uh, that, that's needed. And so uh, while we're focusing on middle school and high school, we got to continue to focus in the early, early area. So the, so the key is when you talk about this interconnectedness, we can't talk about uh, black boys uh, or community. While the lens, the narrow lens of our strategy is uh, black boys, but this is really a community building strategy. The wide angle is a community building strategy. So we can't talk about this uh, uh, change in this without looking at community climate, looking at family climate, and looking at school climate. And one of the first things that was brought up on a, a couple of occasions is that economics. And when we look at, you know, we heard the cliche, the, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. And when we take a look at our villages, and particularly high concentrated poverty areas, um, there is a, a lack of social capital, financial capital, and our villages are, are, are hurting. Uh, I heard Janice talk about how income matters and middle class kids are read to more than uh, a poor kids. So they say that by the time they get to kindergarten, uh, middle class kids uh, hear 20,000 more words uh, than, and so uh, that's even happening more so with our, our boys. I think another issue is, uh, and I you know, was raised by a strong uh, single mom um, I think she had to be uh, one of those seven generals uh, <laughs> that uh, black woman that we were talking about. She was a, 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 a down with that. And I, the issue of uh, a family structure and parent involvement, and I remember uh, very vividly um, that from sixth grade to seventh grade, we had to take, uh, make a choice between major gym and major math and science. And I remember going home, all my friends were going to major gym and they were going to play sock, uh, sock hockey tournaments, basketball tournaments, and the school that I uh, went to was diverse. And what I saw was that all the uh, Caucasian and Asian kids were going to major math and science. And I remember going to my mother and asking them to sign this form for uh, major uh, gym. And she looked at me and said, boy, you're crazy. You're not going to major gym. And so one of the things that we're seeing in the families is, um, a lack of parent involvement and a lack of organizing. And then when you look at economic uh, 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 stress, and they talk about how it's important, it's 70 percent of um, you know, black children are born out of wedlock. Um, fathers uh, are absent in our communities, which has a direct impact not only on boys, but it has a direct impact on uh, all, all children. Uh, I was reading this report, the black-white achievement gap, when progress stopped. Uh, by ETS Policy Information Report, and they talked about several indicators that showed that in the 80s, the gap, achievement gap, well, the gap was uh, kind of closing. In the 80s, it, it stopped. Some people may want to say cracked. But one of the things that they uh, talked about was the increasing absenteeism of fathers uh, in, in, in the household. So responsible fatherhood uh, strategies, finding ways to engage uh, dads in the lives of children. One of our grantees, uh, the Black Star Project, uh, implements something that's called the Million uh, of Father March. And it's a whole uh, uh, campaign, advocacy campaign, to get dads to take their children to school on the first day of school. Once they're there, get them involved in uh, PTA. Get them involved because uh, what we really need, particularly, uh, well, not just particularly for boys, boys but for all our children, is um, just a culture of uh, education, and education is uh, Im important. Um, our communities are economically uh, distressed. Uh, the Breaking Barriers report that Ivory Tolson talked about, uh, uh, wrote about, he talked about the importance of nutrition and how important that was to our uh, uh, educational development. And so if we can't get fresh food, fresh vegetables, in our communities, our children are not coming to school uh, ready to learn. And so when you look at the community, are there open libraries? Is there ch uh, child care? Is there Head Start? Is there a, a, a pre-K? Those are all factors that um, are, are, are critical uh, for all our children. Um, 
one of the, uh, and then we look at you know, the family. I talked about single uh, parent household and the lack of, uh, of fathers, and I was glad to hear uh, that we have to focus from zero to three. Uh, one of my form, the former organization that worked for uh, Harlem Children's Zone, they have a model called Baby College, where they organize a group of parents together uh, before, while they're pregnant, making sure they get prenatal care, but giving some information about uh, uh, cognitive development, age-appropriate uh, behavior. Um, I know many of us uh, in this audience, we got whipped for age-appropriate uh, <laughs> uh, uh, behavior. And, and being able to do this in a community, community setting, um, you know, every once in a while, you know, I have four kids, a whipping is all right, but there's, you know, we, 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 we can uh, whip our kids for some uh, inappropriate, age-appropriate behavior. But the whole notion of working with parents in a group to read to their children and the, the importance of, uh, of that, uh, the zero to three uh, um, involvement, is really, really uh, critical. And they talk about how important it is for um, children to be spoken to, not only read to. And if you only have one parent in the household, that's like, you know, uh, one less uh, adult voice. And so what we're also struggling with in our, in our communities is a sense of a, a lack of social capital and isolation. Uh, we don't know our neighbors the way we used to growing up. Uh, we don't trust sending our kids down the hall or across the street uh, for uh, uh, neighborly child, child care. So particularly in concentrated uh, areas of poverty, um, Families are struggling, there's no sense of uh, child care, and um, we're seeing that more and more impact uh, 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 the boys. And we can't talk about this and not address the whole issue of that, you know, 2,000, 1.5 million children uh, had parents that were incarcerated, and most of those uh, in, in, in the black community were uh, uh, fathers. And so we're investing in uh, a number of uh, uh, strategies that are focusing on supporting boys. Uh, I mentioned the Shot Foundation, uh, the Million Father March uh, by the Black Star Project. There's a group, the Urban Leadership Institute, that has this Raising Him Alone campaign to uh, work with uh, uh, single, single mothers. Uh, there's a coalition of schools educating boys of color that responds to the personal development and cultural competency uh, uh, issues around school climate where in some instances a uh, pre-K or kindergarten Caucasian boy who is active, he's creative. <laughs> the other side, if it's an African-American boy, he is disruptive and is treated differently. And how are we seeing um, the increase of boys from K to three being suspended, uh, prematurely, uh, unfairly put into a, a special ed, unfair and harsh uh, 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 discipline uh, codes. And so just in the last uh, 30 seconds, a uh, couple of things that I would propose uh, to do and that needs to be done, and this is not just for boys, it's for our entire uh, uh, community. Uh, certainly models like uh, the Harlem Children's Zone model, and while that's not a panacea, but looking at uh, zones of blocks, and where is the p uh, political will and the investment for those kind of models. There was originally $200 million uh, in the budget for this cut down to uh, $20 million. So politically, uh, how serious are we about investing uh, in those uh, communities? Uh, I really think, uh, and I think this is another uh, military, I think I drank the military Kool-Aid. <laughs> there needs to be a, a, a surge in our community about the culture of reading. There's a brother in the back, Patrick Oliver, that has a na nationwide campaign that really just changes the culture about teaching our boys to read. But if we don't get the faith community involved in this uh, uh, effort, and, and saturate our, our community with this uh, crisis. So there's also book clubs for children. We, I know we got our own book clubs, but we can do that for children. Philanthropic uh, 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 partnerships, uh, more investments in summer learning so uh, our boys can, uh, uh, can catch up. And uh, I will uh, end right there. Thank you so much. Boy, you gave us a lot to chew on there. Yeah, um, and, um, and we will uh, hopefully have a chance to come back to some of that because I think you, um, some of the issues you raised that we've, and also what some of the other speakers have raised, I, I think we can try to weave some threads through there to, to pull them all together. Um, you did mention the, the cut in funding, so we're going to um, 
uh, look at David Johns and, and expect you to explain that okay. um, <laughs> because um, you are um, you do represent the federal government. Um, but um, but but as Sean made clear, these difficulties are um, are going to require a lot of different entities to weigh in and and play an important role. Um, and of course, the federal government has a has a has a critical role. As as we all know, the um, education is a state function, but it but it is a major national concern. And um, in your role on the on the Senate Help Committee, um, you're involved with not only developing policies but also trying to develop. And, and implement policies that actually, first of all, can, can get passed um, and that will work, which can be very, very tricky. And, right. and sometimes, our, that, sometimes that is mutually exclusive. Right. Um, but um, can you talk some about the, the, uh, the landscape um, of the um, federal um, education initiatives and what kinds of things you're doing um, at the federal level? to address a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today. Well, certainly. Um, let me start by saying thank you on behalf of myself and the Democratic members of the Senate Health Committee for this invitation uh, to Stephanie, um, Dr. Innocent, and, and Dr. Scott. Um, I am a senior education advisor, as was already said, on the Senate Health Committee. We are responsible for 40% of the legislation that comes through the Senate in any given Congress, any given two-year period. Um, to be clear, I am the only African-American male that sits on that committee that touches legislation that impacts each and every person in this room and somebody that you know. Um, things like health care, um, Workforce Investment Act, um, pension uh, reauthorizations, unemployment insurance, um, and No Child Left Behind all get authorized in my committee. Um, what wasn't mentioned in my announcement and what I think is important so you guys understand the lens through which I am accessing all of these conversations is that prior to doing this work, I was an elementary school teacher in Harlem, New York. Um, and so many of the things that we've talked about and that have been talked about anecdotally are things that I lived. And prior to becoming a teacher, I was much more interested in uh, theoretical conversations about black boys. A lot of my comments are going to dovetail with what Sean talked about. And I was really fascinated with why it is that we, as a society, always talk about black men as problem people. Anybody who's ever seen Essence, who's listened to the radio, who's read the Washington Post in the last six months has seen a story about how black men are causing problems to themselves or to their communities. Um, and it wasn't until I found myself as a kindergarten teacher in front of a classroom where there was not a single black boy out of 52 students, where I had six out of eight African-American girls across the grades and where I was one of three black male teachers in the entire building that all of these problems materialized right before my eyes. So a couple of points that I just want to make. One, um, Sean talked about ninth grade being the point at which it's too late to catch up. Um, before that, there was a clarification that I very much appreciated that acknowledged kindergarten as the point at which we needed to be focusing these conversations. Um, Tom Harkin, my boss, often says that learning starts at birth, but the preparation starts well before birth. Um, what I saw as a kindergarten teacher was that, and I saw this when I did home visits before my kids ever stepped foot in my classroom, where I could look and see um, in, the, in, the, in the homes that were more socioeconomically challenged, where there were um, non-stable um, structures to support kids and their families, where there were not books at present, my kids came in and tried to catch up. And what you have in African-American kids often is this resilience, this passion for learning and for living that compensates for that. By the time you get to third grade, that often diminishes. So if you follow somebody like Jawanza Kanjufu, who talks about the fact that often, and this goes back to the conversations we've been having about social emotional learning and the importance of dealing with the whole child, is that by the time a black boy who's never seen a person who's affirmed him in any way, shape, or form gets to third grade, he's decided that school is not for him. So often in between the period between third and ninth grade, he's just trying to figure out what to do with the time that he has there. And so this, this, this conversation, and we're talking about third grade because that's the point at which we federally require people to test. It's also the point at which there are many other uh, transitions that happen within kids, mostly social, emotionally. They start to talk about relationships in a different way. Um, but really, this conversation is one about national security because if we don't find ways to effectively deal with educating not only all of our kids, but in particular black males, and I say black men because we have continuously occupied the lowest rung of any quality of life indicator for generations we will not be able to continue to grow as an economy, as a society. Um, it is utterly a question of national security. And the link um, that I'll use to go into, uh, just giving you guys an overview of the legislative process, is that when I worked for Congressman Rangel, he would always talk about how funny it is that whenever we talk about building a, a, a prison or funding a war, there's never, ever, 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 ever a question up front about how we're going to pay for it. 
But as soon as we talk about funding a school or a project to invest in our kids and make sure that they're able to compete or possess a second language so that they are, uh, are able to compete with their international counterparts, people put their hands in their pockets and they start looking around the room and up at the sky because they don't want to catch your eye. It becomes a tough conversation to have when you're talking about investing limited resources and educational opportunities, particularly with people whose students are already benefiting from those opportunities because they're, they're in the private school system. A whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer the question of what we've been doing in the Senate Help Committee, um, I, I just want to give you guys a context over the last two years and then I'll tell you where we are now. Um, the Higher Education Reconciliation passed with Health Care Reconciliation earlier this year. This was a bill that was a legacy of Senator Edward Kennedy primarily, but that was passed with the help of a lot of members in, in both the House and the Senate. This bill invested $36 billion um, to increase the maximum annual Pell Grant so that uh, low-income minority kids in particular have opportunities to go to higher education. It was uh, $750 million um, to spur college access, $2.55 billion invested specifically in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions. That includes tribal colleges and Hispanic-serving institutions. And a $2 billion investment in community college. This is um, specifically around the types of programs that our veterans, our older workers, and individuals who are laid off will come to to be retrained and find employment opportunities in this tough economic climate. Um, before that, the recovery bill was the single largest investment in education ever. Often people talk about the GI Bill. This uh, surpasses that um, in spades. Um, ARA invested in education ex uh, exclusively $96 billion with the B. This was to supplement um, a lot of the cuts that states are having to make as a result of the tough economic crisis. This included uh, $13 billion in Title I. Title I is the primary funding stream for low-income schools, those serving high concentrations of kids in poverty or who are benefiting from free and reduced price lunch. It also included a $4.1 billion investment in early childhood education, something that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, Right now, we are currently um, working on three uh, large reauthorizations, the first of which is CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. Related to that bill, there are a couple others, FIFSA, the Family Violence Services Prevention Act, Abandoned Infants, um, and uh, Adoption Opportunities. Those four bills are being uh, worked through the Senate Subcommittee on Children and Families. It's chaired by Senator Dodd, and we're hoping to pass that bill. That's relevant to this conversation because it provides states with a lot of the resources they use to address the needs of the families that we've been talking about, those who lack the social services to be able to navigate systems effectively, to find ways to help them children optimize their educational opportunities. The second bill is WEA, the Workforce Investment Act. Um, that bill is the bill that um, is very directly linked to that community college investment I talked about earlier. Um, WEA supports job training centers, unemployment centers that you might find them in the states that are designed to help people find um, employment pathways, those that lead to uh, family sustaining wages and um, opportunities to advance in career fields. And then the last one is um, everybody's favorite bill, No Child Left Behind. Um, I say that sort of tongue in cheek because No Child Left Behind is the one bill that uh, people are almost guaranteed to have an opinion of, um, favorable or otherwise. Um, a couple of things that are important to remember about ESCA is that uh, what it did was take conversations that we would often have in rooms like this with people who know personally, somebody who didn't graduate, who was failed by school, who has nothing positive to say about school, and quantify it. It gave us data through which we could understand which schools, which systems, which individuals need resources to help them improve achievement. Uh, we now have the tough task of identifying the lessons learned over the last six years and finding ways to fix the bill. Um, there are quite a few large issues um, accounting for graduation rates, looking at how we disaggregate data, how we uh, provide credit for growth over time, how it is that we uh, do the job of making sure that not only teachers but leaders, administrators, principals have the skills they need in order to understand what developmental appropriate um, uh, curricula looks like at the early level, for example. Um, uh, those things we're now negotiating. Um, to be clear, it is a tough climate um, in which to have these conversations, let alone the past legislation. And the closer we get to November, um, the more difficult these conversations will become. 
Um, Stephanie asked early uh, on for us to leave you guys with things that would be helpful, um, and, and I have two. One of them is to find ways to get involved politically. Um, each of you have a member of Congress who represents your district. You have a senator who represents your state. Um, talk to them about the need to have these conversations, um, tough conversations about resource allocation, about teacher training, about how it is that we as a federal government are going to address the question of, of, of what's our responsibility to early childhood education and addressing the needs of women, children, and families. Um, and then the second one is just to put bodies on them. Um, I, I stole that phrase from, from Bill Cosby, who has gotten in a lot of trouble for talking about, I think, his ruminations on what it has been to um, watch the evolution of society from the, the eyes of a, of a black man. And in 2009, I was privileged enough to write an essay for the State of Black America report, which focused explicitly on the crisis facing black men. And this essay it was the first essay in the book. It was titled Reimagining Black Masculine Identity. It grew out of my master's thesis project, which was a study of how the, the six black boys um, that were in sixth grade at the school at which I taught navigated being in a space in which everybody thought they knew them, because everybody feels like they know black men, because we're oh, so uh, written about. Um, but it, it really focused on um, what Sean talked about as a distinction between um, sort of good boys and bad boys or what was previously articulated as a distinction between those who performed in uh, ways that were accepted and those who didn't. Um, and what was sort of um, significant for me to note in this essay is that um, while most people, and in particular most adults and most non-minority adults, fail to give uh, young black men agency, right? They think they do things blindly because TV tells them to or because they think it's cool. Um, the black boys in my study and, and, and the ones that I taught were acutely aware of how it is that people saw them, in many ways used it to their advantage. Um, the tangible example is that I had one student who would do everything he could to get in trouble in the first five minutes of art class. Why? Because he didn't want to deal with the teacher. When I interviewed her, what she would say is, I don't understand him. I don't get the music he listens to. I don't appreciate the art that he says that he likes. And half the time, I don't understand the words that are coming out of his mouth. What does he say? She just doesn't get me. She doesn't take the time to ask me questions. She doesn't even get my name right. And she's just going to kick me out, so why should I care? So he did everything he could to get kicked out in the first five minutes to then spend the rest of the time talking to the black counselor down the hall who didn't ask him some of the same questions she asked. And I offer that as an example of how complicated these problems are, but also to go back to where we started and locate that this is not a problem that the federal government can solve alone. It's also not a problem that any individual nonprofit, organization, state agency, or other entity can solve alone. This is an all hands on deck issue. Um, when, before I, I started, I saw a couple people nodding off and I fought the urge as a kindergarten teacher to first ask you guys to stand up and do some jumping jacks, but also to nudge your neighbor and say that, you, you know, this conversation is one that I enjoy participating in because I'm very passionate about education, but it's also one that I would be so thankful to not ever have to have again. The sad reality is that the same set of issues that we're grappling with are issues that have been persistent and prevalent in our community for a lot longer than I've been alive. And as we continue to grapple with some of these larger challenges, like how it is that we deal with bilateral trade relationships with China, mm -hmm. how it is that we think about moving into a country that we know is flat, that we know requires us to be a global citizen, but half of our kids don't have, uh, half of our adults don't have passports, half of our kids don't even understand the, the need to explore critical foreign language, and in almost every other country, developed or otherwise, kids are required to learn a second language. These problems are vexing and they're tough. Um, and so what I can ask of you again is to find ways to get involved, take the knowledge that you have, the benefit of being uh, privileged enough to sit in rooms like this and listen to people pontificate and find ways to make it meaningful. If that means finding um, books that you don't read anymore, or magazines that you have already used and donating them, then do so. If it means men in the room showing up so that black boys and black girls have a presence with which to um, disassociate or diffuse some of these negative stereotypes and they believe, then find a way to just be present. There's so much more that we can do. Um, there is a very critical role for federal policy and we will continue to push as much as we can in the face of the Tea Party and every other opposition that is coming our way, but it's not something that we can do alone. Um, with that, I'll be quiet because I know everybody else wants to get into the conversation. So thank you. Well, well thank you, David. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
his passion and his, it, it, he combines his passion with this really deep knowledge about it, which uh, just makes you so effective. Um, but David, you raised a point that has come up several times um, in this discussion that I just want to return to briefly before we will we'll take some questions. But this goes back to issues of, of, um, uh, of cultural competence and of understanding the students that, um, uh, that we're dealing with. Um, and being able to, and I think, um, Sean, you mentioned, you know, it, um, uh, well, actually, it's either Sean or, I'm not sure, but um, going to where the students are, getting to where they are to, um, to begin teaching them. Um, I think that's, that's a really critical factor, but I keep hearing in my head when we talk about, especially cultural competence, I keep hearing the pushback. Um, from folks either who don't understand or really don't care about our children's education. Um, and I can hear the argument, you're, uh, you want to teach children Ebonics. You want to, you know, you're teaching, you're teaching down to children. We know that's not the case, but how do you explain this in a way? How do we have this conversation and help our policymakers, our politicians, our educators understand um, how to address all of these issues in a way that targets our children, um, because we do really need to, you know, help them catch up without being pushed back with the argument of that, that this is an agenda that is either only, you know, it's only focusing on certain children. We don't have the resources for that, or that we are um, we're teaching down to children. Uh, so uh, let me try and answer that question. It's a big one. Um, let me start with a disclaimer that in DC we operate in a world of um, we operate in a world in which phrases and terms take on a life of their own, mm -hmm. um, and cultural competency is one of those phrases like accountability, like mm -hmm. uh, growth models, like uh, innovation. innovation that so many people use so often and mean so many different things that in many ways the word is meaningless. And so um, I say that because for me, it's, it, the response is it's a framing shift. It's less about cultural competency um, for a couple of reasons. One, all my, I, I think often that translates into people thinking that it simply means finding people of color to stand in front of other people of color. Mm -hmm. Or it means buying some off-the-shelf product that essentializes somebody's understanding of a monolithic group, group's culture in ways that can easily be taught to somebody so that they can repeat them. Um, the things I struggle with are this. One, all my skin folk ate my kin folk. I met a whole lot of black people who don't understand culture. Um, I met a whole lot of white people who understand minority cultures in ways that their uh, minority counterparts haven't. Um, as somebody who went into education not having formally prepared for it, what was most important for me was to understand that my job was to meet my kids where they were. Um, what that meant was less being able to say that I had taken a class or had some meaningful experience in every, um, every culture represented in my class, which was just not possible. Living in New York, there were kids that, have, that, that, that came from everywhere. But it was understanding that my job was to individualize instruction. It was to find out where my kids were, where they were with their literacy skills, their prenumeracy skills, their uh, pencil grip, their socializing skills, if they could understand patterns or sequencing, and identify the gap, come up with the plan for how to cover the gap in the time that I had in the, within that year. Um, so maybe it's using that word individualization or individualized instruction as a way to move away from um, how easily politicized some of these conversations are. But the challenge is really equipping teachers with the skills they need to be responsive to a classroom of teachers. Um, and in particular, when we're having this conversation at a point in time in which I think everybody is acknowledging that minority doesn't exist anymore, and I say that simply because the minority populations are now the majority populations, um, we have to find ways to be more thoughtful about addressing the needs of all of our learners, and that includes English language learners, kids with disabilities, uh, real or otherwise, um, in ways that are meaningful. The thing that's most challenging, and then I'll shut up, about all of this is that um, culture is important, right? We're, we're not having this conversation in a vacuum in which we can't acknowledge that um, black people are un uniquely affected by the spate of issues and the way in which they are. Um, the statistics are overwhelming. Some of the ones that we haven't talked about um, are the fact that 84% of black 12th graders read below grade level, and 94% of them are doing math below grade level. That's compared to some 57% of white kids. Um, we haven't talked about the fact that only 50,000 black males earn a bachelor's degree each year compared, uh, but an estimated one in three of them are under correctional supervision. Um, what um, 
Sean was talking about with regard to black boys is so significant because to me it illustrates that they categorically are left behind even before they get to start the race. There was a Yale um, Child Study Center report uh, released in 05 or 06 that found that the state expulsion rates for pre-kindergartners exceeded those in K-12 classes in all but three states. What I'm saying is that essentially black boys accounted for 91.4% of preschool expulsions. Mm -hmm. They're kicking the babies out before they're even supposed to be able to, to, to read the alphabet. Um, and that has everything to do with how it is that we culturally understand and then situate black boys within an educational context. And the parallels between education and prisons are not um, insignificant, but, but, but I think that the, 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 the answer to the question of how we move forward in ways that would be helpful in advancing this conversation is to get away from the easily politicized um, phrases that we associate with cultural competency and talk about how all of this is more about individualizing instruction and meeting kids where they are and providing educators and administrators with the resources they need to be effective. And I would just like to add to that, that okay. in, in the halls of higher ed, one of the places that we see this as a very critical battle is, is as teachers are in preparation, their preparation for teaching, to introduce this notion and help them understand that it's not just children of color who have culture, that every child has culture, and that the basic premise about around human development is that everybody is socialized in a culture. In this particular society, people are, we learn to see middle income, garden variety white kids as humans, not as cultural beings, but they too are cultural beings. And so we work, we encourage um, work in higher ed to really help people understand culture in its true uh, academic form, if you will. And so, because we, we think that it is, teachers are the ones that have to understand that the reasons um, certain cultural groups are successful in school is because they do have culturally consistent practices. They just don't call them that. Um, and that, that their kids are not, that all kids are, are cultural beings. Once that becomes sort of the norm around teacher preparation, it's a lot easier to work on cultural consistency because it's not about the race of the teacher. It is about the culture of the teacher. And culture is something that is learned, and it is, um, it is entirely possible that our teacher preparation programs can, in fact, do instruction that would enable anyone who comes in to become culturally competent, regardless of their backgrounds. Okay. And, and one of the things that is um, a huge piece of education reform is the data or are the data, and how we use those. And I know it's kind of um, controversial sometimes to talk about tying teacher leader effectiveness to student performance, but if we have the data for our individual students, we have to make sure that every child counts for every teacher. So when we are looking at those data, we're determining what significant growth is for every child. And then we are saying that we're going to intervene appropriately with the teaching, not just with the student. Because what we do now is when the data indicate that there is a problem with learning, we want to intervene with the student. It has to be twofold. We have to intervene with that teacher to the points that have been made and give them the skill sets that they need. And it can't be done in isolation. A lot of what we do is pull teachers out of the classroom, take them somewhere, have a conversation about cultural competence. They go back into the classroom. They go right back to their routines. And they, it doesn't matriculate into the environment. What we have to be more um, aggressive about is embedded professional development, where, as has been said, Educators are working with each other, they're observing with each other, they're giving each other feedback, they're sharing strategies with their, that they're using with their kids, but the data have to speak to the effectiveness of the teacher. We can't guess about that anymore because they are getting to ninth grade reading on third grade and fifth grade level. We have to intervene appropriately. We have to have a metric um, around which we're going to intervene with our teachers to help them be better for our students. Thank you. Um, now, we're, we're due to finish at 6 o'clock, but I, we, did want to, um, we, we did want to, again, bring you something very specific from each of the panelists. David already gave you your marching orders, but um, to have each of the panelists offer something very specific and concrete. And then we also wanted to, do, to have some questions. Will, we, will there be time for questions? Doug? I think
Okay. Well, why don't we go, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and um, have everyone give you their suggestion for what you can do so we can, do you want to do the questions yeah. first? Okay. We talked we'll do, okay, very good. Why don't we do the questions? Um, there are mics on, um, is there a mic over here? There's, there is a mic over here, or if you just want to stand up. Um, how many people have questions? Just rate, show of hands. Four. Okay, very good. Five. Um, He's saying use the mic so that they can record it. Okay, there's a mic right over here. Is, I can't see, is there a mic on this side? No. Okay. This, okay. this panel will maybe bring up a, a lot of questions, but uh, I just try to shorten it as, as, uh, as best I can. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is Stephen Perry. I'm, I'm pretty sure as educators, everyone knows who Stephen Perry is and his, how he was successful. Maybe they should, they should take a page from, from his book. And then uh, how could the church help in this, in this instance of zero to five? You know, how could the church help? And last, I don't think Essence is owned by blacks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll just address the, the middle question or co comment. Um, I think that churches have an integral uh, part in this uh, equation. Uh, number one, uh, in their congregations um, and the leadership of the churches, making that th this a priority issue, the reading by third grade churches collaborating. I know that sounds miraculous, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And so that it's not just an isolated uh, uh, church that's talking about it or a mosque, that it has to be a, 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 a interfaith uh, a strategy. Um, when we have, you know, children at uh, that early age coming to church, um, usually, you know, sometimes you get older, children decide, or, you know, they get teenagers, well, I'm not going. But if you have that captured audience, make the reading an uh, 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 issue. Also, the last thing I'll say is this working with organizing parents. I think one of the key levers here is really organizing parents, number one, in their homes to read, but also to be advocates in the school. Uh, there's an organization, uh, the Black Alliance for uh, Educational Options, that does a, a great deal of uh, advocacy with parents around policy issues. So it's not community-based leaders, it's actually parents coming to school boards, parents getting in contact with their legislators, uh, people that vote. So just really making this a recurring issue throughout the year, not that this is reading Sunday, uh, education Sunday, that this is a thread throughout uh, the philosophy uh, of the church. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Penny Blue. And just to give you a little bit of my background, I have a corporate background. I worked for IBM for 25 years, and I'm in the process of becoming a tra what they call a transitional teacher. And so because I have a math degree and no education background, I've had to take five education courses. So the piece that I don't really understand is how anyone can be an educator, since I don't consider myself an educator, I've just taken these five courses, when all the literature basically says, when you talk about cultural competence, that we all do better when we are taught by people that understand our culture. So I don't understand how, quote unquote, the educators or the people in legislature don't understand that that is the case when all, there's no literature that I have read or in my classes that said that that's not the case. Uh, and then we look at like Secretary Duncan uh, basically gave a speech a while back. I believe he said 8% of the teachers across the nation are African Americans and only 2% of the teachers across the nation are African American males. So then we look at ourselves and so uh, no wonder we are failing. So my question is how do we address that and or how do you think that we should address that piece? So I disagree with the notion that people don't understand it and would mm -hmm. underscore the fact that it's an incredibly hard thing to legislate at the federal level in this climate. Um, the fact that I, and I said this at the beginning, I was one of three black male teachers, um, is not insignificant and it's not lost on me, right? I was also the only one that taught a core academic subject. One taught art and the other taught PE. Um, but it, it's hard to have not even academic but practical conversations with black boys about teaching when we don't value teachers in our society. 
Um, why would I, and this was something that I struggled with immensely. I graduated from Columbia University at the top of my class um, and could literally, if I could paint, I would paint pictures of the disappointment and confusion in people's faces when I said I was going to become a teacher. Why would you do that? But my response to that is this. And I was told then that, yeah, we don't go into that because it doesn't pay well. And I don't agree with that from this perspective. Me at I, when I'm at IBM, we're not there, quote unquote, because we can't find us. We're not in teaching because we can't find us. Most of the people that go into teaching, and I'm not belittling teachers, but most of the teachers are not the ones that could go get the corporate jobs or those jobs. So it's a so, so I don't know, you and I disagree about this and I no, recognize there's a no, lot. No, people teach for different reasons, right? right? The reasons why I went into teaching are not right. the reasons why you went into teaching. Suffice it to say that I think that the reason why there are so few of us is yeah. because there's no value in the profession, I think because people are poorly paid, and well, because the I'm complications that we've articulated with individuals in hard to serve schools not having resources, parents not being able to engage in ways that are meaningful, having teachers who will lock you out of conversations by talking about deliverables and using terms that we learn in teacher college are all reasons why it's complicated. Racism is a whole nother conversation. That's prevalent well, everywhere. But well, I think that there are unique challenges on. in this field. But, but Actually, let, let me just okay. make a comment about the racism. It's really about um, the resistance to the, the concept of cultural competence is really based in the notion that some cultures are better than others. Right. And that's, that's part of what happens with racism. And so the resistance is not to do culturally competent teaching. It is about using the values systems that belong to those racial groups like African Americans or cultural groups like um, Hispanic Americans that the wider culture doesn't believe contains any value to the learning process, to the growth and development process. And that is, that's fundamentally uh, situated in the notion of, of white superiority. So okay. again, which is one of the reasons that I believe that the teacher education process is where we, we have to penetrate, because we, we have to change those notions for people who, bef as they're entering school, help them see that that's what's interfering with their ability to embrace this concept of cultural competence. Okay, and I'm a drop it, but I know for me, for instance, I have been trying to get a job in the in the education field, and part of the reason I cannot is because of color, and I would help change the culture of the school because the more of us you might have in there could change the culture. Okay, thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Manuela Butler. I have one problem. With all. It's very great. The conversation was for everything, but everything is education, teachers, teachers for. But where the parents come in? Because the child, since the moment he's born until he's five years old, to go to school, he is home in the house with the parents. Everybody in America works, even the whites work, the Chinese work, everybody works, but everybody have time for their children. If we since they are small, we start reading to them, we start putting attention to them, we start talking to them like another human being. Instead of talking down to them, I think they learn to read because mine were reading by the age of five. I, I do believe that that's a part of what we're trying to um, get to in our early success plan yes, around the integrated approach among the agencies, the ready families, the ready communities, the, the so, ready so the way I feel is that they have to get a program to educate the parents how to be parents. Thank well, you. All good early childhood programs definitely do that. And it's not just educating them, it is engaging them in the process of their own children's growth and development. It is a fundamental concept in early education, and I'm talking birth through five. It's a fundamental difference between how the, that element in early childhood, the early earliest years, differs from the philosophy of public schools. We're all part of the same early childhood continuum, but there is a different approach to involvement of parents and engagement of parents in the process when you look at uh, the earliest early childhood period. I just want to add that the federal government now currently invests in um, both uh, PERC's Parent Information Resource Centers, which are designed to provide technical mm -hmm. assistance oh, and yeah. capacity building to schools and to organizations like PTAs to help parents do exactly that, as well as money for school districts to allocate to parents so that they can engage in some of these activities as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Jackie Brown, and it's really Jackie Brown. Um, and I work for Prince William County Schools. I am a school social worker. I want to first commend David Johns for saying what you said about the politically correct things that we say, because we find that also when we're in the conference with our parents. I work in a county that is 75% Hispanic. I have two questions. Um, how can the gap between the teacher and the, um, in the culture of the students be closed because I deal with a lot of resistance. As a matter of fact, this is our second week in school. I have been called, um, been ref there have been three African American um, females who have been referred to me, um, and this is the second week because they have some issues. And these are predominantly white teachers who look at me, we're social workers, we're there, yes, we act as counselors, but you know, our main job is to, to link resources. But now I'm being used to, oh, you could be a great mentor. And this is, I'm like, okay, can we just kind of clean the slate and see how they'll do this year? So my question is, I, I deal with a lot of resistance because I tell the teachers that too. And I also try to let them know I'm there to support them because it is a thing of, because I sit on the special education, um, um, conference as well as well so when we're in the conference it's us and them right. and they'll say to us you know well you don't understand um, I, I have 28 students in my class I don't have time um, for this that's my first question and uh, I was telling I met Miss Jones when I was coming in and I told her that our county got slammed this year because we had a lot of um, um, Hispanic and African American children who were disproportionately um, found eligible for special education. So yeah. we got our hands slapped. Um, we, I work in the summer, so we get this list and we have to go to the schools and review the records. In my um, critique, I said in a few of those um, records, maybe you may want to look at a culturally um, linguistic or culturally sound assessment for these students. I told my um, European white psychologist that I worked with yesterday about that, and she said, I didn't know there was one. So my second question is, how can we broach that to them to let them know, you know, there is other things than the Wessler Four and all the, um, the C. Tony and all the other um, assessments that they use, because at some point, some children actually do need special ed, but I do think that they're a little culturally biased. So I think that you uh, already have the answers to your questions. Um, okay. I'll start with the second one and then go to the first one. Um, okay. With regard to my advice for how to um, change pretty difficult conversations is to just provide people with the information. Um, you can you know, lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. Right. It just uh, uh, augment the fact that she can no longer say that she doesn't know that culturally competent or culturally based assessments exist by just uh, giving her the information. Um, for the first example, um, my, what I try to do, especially when I was a classroom teacher, was to work with the parents. Um, so I struggled in similar ways with having um, young uh, single moms who would come to conferences and have white female teachers talk to them like they um, weren't even adults, let alone their, their peers. Um, my advice in that instance is to find ways to empower, this goes back to the question that I think the woman asked before she left, empower those adults. Um, help them um, understand what the jargon means um, and, and, and remind, them that, that, uh, remind them of the roles. Um, very practically, really quickly, I have a sister who's 15 months younger than I am, uh, seven-year-old um, niece, she's seven but going on 17, and last year in school she struggled because her teacher would often say, Jordan's acting up. Jordan is talkative. So what I talked my entire life, I now get paid to talk. Um, my struggle uh, all of last year was reminding my sister that she needed not be concerned about the social pathology that these, she thinks is associ associated with her being a young single mom, and remind that teacher that it's their job to work together to address whatever challenges that my niece are facing. And so giving her tools to say, is Jordan reading on grade level? Is she going to be prepared at the end of the year to go and start the next year where she needs to be? Right, those tangible things that, have, that, that, that move away from the, the ability for somebody to use culture or to dance around things that don't make sense, finding those things and equipping people with the ways to have those conversations, I think cuts some of it away. Some of it you're not gonna be able to get away from. I would just say own your gifts and own your blessing, own that you can be sort of a conduit or a liaison for those young, young women or young men um, and, and just try to find ways to continue to steal yourself because it can be exhausting. My name is Harry Good. I'll make this very brief. I think I, I'd just like to provide you with a, a, an example, an interesting example that I've experienced. I'm at a two-year college in New York, 
And uh, we had a group who got a lot of ethnics, as you know, coming into New York as throughout the country, right, but sir. real brief. Um, this particular group were Russians in nursing. They were cheating, okay? Students would come to me and say, Dr. Good, they cheat. So anyway, the vice president, an African-American man, uh, had to think about this for a minute, and he went and got a cultural specialist, supposedly in, in Russian culture, to come and take a look at what you and I would call cheating. And if you're told that you can't look at someone's paper and get answers, you should understand that we call it in this country cheating. Nonetheless, had this cultural specialist come in to have a discussion with faculty about what we would consider cheating in America, which they considered uh, a community effort, a group effort, which is an outgrowth of their culture, which is rooted in ideologically socialism, communism. I still call it cheating, but especially when I tell you that you're not supposed to look at someone's paper, but that's how the, how the, the cultural situation was politicized. I just want you to just keep that example, especially yourself, because you kind of brought, you know, triggered that in my mind when you began to uh, talk through the cultural process that we need to be sensitive to. And it seems like other groups, it's a sensitive issue with them and it's handled more delicately versus us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this extraordinary panel. I'm a mother. I have a 10-year-old daughter uh, who was born with an undeveloped nervous system. And by the time she was two, through surgery, we discovered that she was only getting 20% of her hearing capacity. And what each of you shared just had a profound impact on me. Um, I remember the surgeon saying, can your daughter talk? Does she have any hand motor, motor coordination? Can she walk because of the severity of her condition? And I said, yeah, she does all of those things. He said, what did you do? Because she should not be able to function. And someone said it, I talked to her every day. I mean, just, you know, she was just an infant, but whatever we were doing, I was home with her for two years. I just talked to her and I realized that that had an impact. I didn't, I didn't know that, but, but the bigger story that I wanted to share intellectually, despite her uh, challenges, intellectually she was off the charts. And I tried to get her uh, in Fairfax County in Virginia uh, in some special ed support because she really needed assistance with focus. And it, is, it was not then an ethnically diverse community, to say the least. And the principal said to me, there is nothing we can do for your child based on her test results. I later learned that they skewed the test results not to provide services for her. I had her privately tested uh, costing me uh, an upwards of $10,000 for all the services and got a team and threatened lawsuits and all that. I finally got the services she needed, everything that she needed, and by the third grade she came up 14 reading levels from that support. She had six specialists working with her 20 hours a week and I fought very aggressively for that. And I know there are a lot of other families that wouldn't have the resources or you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mad dog about my daughter and I'm gonna get what she needs and I'm, you know, the advocacy needs to be there and how many other children aren't getting the support they need because of situations like that. So, um, I wanna do more and I also want to help other parents who may have the same situation. So, I just wanted to share my story. Thank you. Thanks. That's a, that's a very powerful story. Yes. And, um, in fact, uh, we're, we're going to wrap up now with, um, as, as promised, with, some very, with a very specific takeaway that um, each person thinks you should have. But I think that, I think what you talked about is one of the takeaways. I think we, we weren't expecting the audience members to give us takeaways, yes. but, uh, but I think that was a very, very um, powerful statement and it helps us better understand the kinds of things that need to be done and that can be done by an individual. Um, to really make a difference, even if it's it, it, even if it's a difference in one child's life, but I think what you did probably is going to affect um, a lot of children, not just your own child. So I think that's a very very powerful statement you gave. Um, so we we're, um, we some of the panelists did have to go; they had trains to catch. Um, but um, we would like to leave um, leave you with something very specific, so you can walk out of here with something that you can do in your communities uh, to make a difference to help, the, help improve the 
um, educational opportunities for children, and specifically uh, to improve, um, to give children a better chance at, uh, at greater reading proficiency by, by third grade. Um, we will start with, uh, with Dr. Day and your well, suggestion. I think that my suggestion is that um, we have to continue to express confidence and faith in our children and their capacities and in our families and their abilities to contribute to our children's development. And that takes, the, that takes many forms. Um, it means that we have to speak up against, uh, speak out against things that we see that interfere with our ability to do that, that interfere with our ability as parents to engage in the programs that they participate in, to, you know, to make policy, to contribute to policy, to ask questions, um, to intervene in uh, things that we don't think should be happening. Um, someone mentioned resilience. We are a resilient community. Uh, we historically, it's probably our strongest trait. And I believe that as we see the conditions around, that surround our children deteriorating, and we have all these studies that, that tell us that they are not uh, being positioned to thrive, it is really in our hands to um, not let that affect our belief in our and our abilities to overcome and be resilient. Thank you, thank you. General? Well, gracious, I'm not an educator, so I didn't get very much in on that, on the rest of that conversation, but so insightful. Uh, I do have a couple of thoughts, and then uh, what I consider my takeaway. Uh, and that is that I think we, we have to start understanding that this, in fact, this, in, this crisis uh, with our children in reading is in fact a national security crisis. Um, and while we can incarcerate them, we can keep them basically illiterate, uh, we can ignore their nutrition and their health needs uh, today, if we continue to do that, um, our legacy will be that there will, be, there will not be an America that was intended to be. Uh, we need to get our parents uh, involved in the process, we've heard that. Um, I think we also need to build on uh, something that was talked about, this uh, making the teaching profession a well-respected uh, profession uh, with training and, co and, and compensation. Um, certainly engage academia and industry. Um, and for my takeaway, I think we just need to, while this is, uh, it may sound a little cliche-ish, we need to take the talk to action and go to our, uh, our legislators, um, go in our communities and say fund education as if our way of life depends on it because it does. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. Let me first associate myself with uh, those brilliant comments um, from these young women. Um, secondly, thank you all for hanging in there. I recognize we've gone over. There's never, ever enough time to talk about education, but in particular, I appreciate you guys um, staying after. Um, the things I'll say are, are just echoing the, the comments I made before with regard to legislation. Senator Patty Murray introduced a bill called the LEARN Act. LEARN is an acronym. Um, the, the words escape me, but it's essentially um, the way in which we and the Senate are talking about literacy provision. Um, the bill essentially talks about the ways in which states should design comprehensive and high quality literacy programs that cover kids from birth through post-secondary education. Um, calling to, to, to identify your support for that bill as well as for the continued uh, progress of the No Child Left or ESEA would be uh, very, very helpful. Um, the second thing I'll go back to is just putting bodies on them. I was up here just flipping through this calendar, and one of the toughest things that I do is explain to people that my job is to argue um, reasons why it is that we need to invest in educating young children. Um, and the tagline on, on one of my email accounts is teach the babies. Um, somebody indicated, and people often say I'm not an educator, um, that phrase just doesn't make much sense to me. And so what I'll say to you is just identify your skills. 
identify the things that you're good at, what you're passionate about. I promise you there's some way to make it tangibly um, relevant to educating young kids and helping them read. Again, if it's finding books and donating them, taking your time to read to kids, um, helping to do a, a drive where you get your church to donate books, um, or you get your church to donate time where you guys all go and mentor, do something that's meaningful and that's sustained. It's really important, um, in particular for kids of color who come from fragile communities who don't have support, for you guys to think about sustained involvement, especially with regard to mentoring. But I think one of the most important things we can do to take the talk and make it um, actionable is to actually put your body on a child. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you to all the panelists. I think this was a, it was a tremendous um, conversation. Um, as I said, some of the panelists had to leave. But um, we hope that this has inspired you. We hope it's given you information to now you've heard the talk, and now we can all walk the walk, and we all have a lot of work to do. So thank you very much for coming and for sticking around, and we look forward to seeing you again.